the fact that we relegate <laughs> black history to a month in the year mm-hmm. in this country, the shortest month of the year in this country, when we talk about American history, American history is black American history. Hi, you're listening to Good Is In The Details. This is episode 20, and I'm your host, Gwendolyn Dalski. And today I am with organizing director for California Yimby. That means yes in my backyard, Constantine Hatcher. Hello, Gwendolyn. Hello. It's been ages since we've got a I understand <laughs> that there's congratulations in order for you. There is. Uh-huh. I have uh, some wonderful... In fact, I'm holding her right now. This amazing... <laughs> Little human being that is and I hear, extremely cute. I hear the mom is pretty fantastic too. Yeah, she's I. I know. She's <laughs> okay. I'm hopefully, to hopefully, this get something on the record clearly, there, but you you foiled that. Right? Clearly, this little cutie takes <laughs> takes after her mom because she's adorable. So okay, good. So on the record, just check. Yeah, All check right, check that. So you were uh, recently on an employment panel for black professionals for My Friend's Place. So tell me a little bit about that. It was a really cool event. You know, My Friend's Place is a a nonprofit that provides direct service to young people, late teens, early 20s, that are struggling in life, whether they are, you know, firm or foster Kids that have been kind of kicked out of the system with minimal resources. Some are homeless. Some are trying to work through trauma. Others might be working through addiction or other mental health issues. Just generally Mm -hmm. trying to um, provide a place for them to at least not crash and burn or not fall so hard. or Where they can get direct resources, whether it's food, clothes, a place to just lay their heads and take a nap to get career advice, counseling services, parenting, coaching. Well, let me ask you, for something like this, um, when you're giving advice or you're talking about being a black professional, what would be important elements that, let's say, at-risk youth should know or anyone should know about what does that mean? I think in this situation... I like to focus on, you know, I think of my sons first and foremost, right? They're in this age group, 20 and 17. And I think of the things that I try to impart to them. Sometimes they grab it. Sometimes they're like, eh, whatever, dad. I try to deliver messages of inspiration and hope that anything is possible and that, you know, encourage them that no matter what their current situation, there is no ceiling. Um, I try to impart messages of how to navigate a system that is oftentimes unfriendly or <laughs> unfriendly at best or unequal at best, mm-hmm. um, downright discriminatory and hostile at worst for people that look like us with, you know, a little browner skin just inherently. And when you walk in the door, you know, and I share some of those stories that, you know, here I am, I'm a, I have a pretty decent gig. I get to work doing something I love and I'm passionate about. I get to make a decent salary and live, you know, semi-comfortably. And yet, you know, I I want them to know that they can get to where I'm at and beyond, way beyond. What would be an example of specific advice for an aspiring young person of color or a black person? I mean, you know, I think I I don't think these things are... I mean, as opposed to somebody who's... As opposed to anybody else, what is like a specific piece of... So what I talk to them about, right, some of it is... Things that all people should know in these particular situation that they someone may not be there to tell them. And maybe seeing someone that looks like them talk to them about it, it might resonate more. So there's things, you know, more general about just professionalism, right? Be great. Build a strong network. Build a network in terms of and really breaking down what that means. It means finding mentors, talking to as many people as you can. Whenever you have the opportunity to meet people, always be on your your A game, right? And being able to represent yourself in the best light, being confident in yourself mm-hmm. and not getting discouraged and understanding that just because even though the race, the, the gun may go off in the race and someone might be grabbing you by the belt and saying, uh, uh, hold up, hold up. And everyone's running, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 yards, 50 meters down the track. And then all of a sudden you're letting go and say, okay, go catch up. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't run your ass off to try to get there. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, don't quit. You don't give up. You keep fighting. You keep running as hard as you can. And eventually you will catch them. 
sometimes you won't, sometimes you will, but you got to keep trying. You can't let that be an excuse for, you know, don't let that hold you back. Don't let that be an excuse. It's messed up. It's not fair. But at the same time, you got to keep put your head down and keep going. And if you happen to win the race, if you happen to get through a door, don't close it behind you. Kick that mofo open and grab a bunch of people and bring them through with you. Right. Reach back and bring them through. So just the kind of general things around professionalism, you know, show up looking professional is important. How you look, that first impression is so important. So talking about different, like just general business acumen things, things I've learned and just through my work experience, right? And having to navigate professional situations. Is Um, there a piece of advice that has stuck with you that somebody's given you? It's all kinds. I mean, all these things are things that I've learned and have, you know, had people mentor me in some way or another. I want to come back to that because I do want to, you know, finish that thought around the generalities, but also talk about things that are specific to being to the black experience. right? Yeah. And so making sure that, I, you know, they they might see me as someone that might be successful, generally speaking. Right. Um, I have found some great success in my life. But there's also I always want to make sure that I tell them about a little bit of my story coming up. So they also understand that, you know, I have faced also some of the things that I'm sure they are facing now um, that, you know, trying to get out there and trying to start things off. So I try to also ground it in also that black experience, which is also very unique and can be very discouraging and daunting at times and make you feel, you know, disconsolate and and just overwhelmed and feel like giving up or feel like, why am I trying? You know, things like I told the story of, in this particular case, I told the story of when I was home from college one, I think maybe my, after my second or third year, uh, me and my brother were looking for jobs, you know, we're looking, you know, we're trying to find any kind of summer job to just get some cash coming in. Um, we didn't have, you know, any real help from our families at that time. It was just us. We were, you know, swing, sink or swim, baby, sink or swim. And so, you know, we were calling around for jobs. And, you know, I, I know how to, uh, my name's Constantine Hatcher. So it's not a very uh, ethnic sounding name. I know how to code switch. I can put on my very educated, safe, don't non-threatening voice over the phone. That's um, <laughs> Yeah, it sounds very, you know. Um, but I mean, you know, and it's, it's not just that it's, it's about being professional and, you know, knowing your audience and speaking uh-huh. in a way that um, that they can relate to. But at any rate, so, you know, on the phone, they, we talk to them. They're like, oh, you know, I give them my background. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, come on down. We're hiring. Yeah, we'd love to get you guys in. It's like almost sounding like, hey, I got the job. I just have to show up. I show up and literally, I, you know, I catch the bus. I was staying by USC at the time. Catch the bus down to Beverly Center to the movie theater there. And walk in for the interview, me and my brother, and all of a sudden, it, you, I mean, you could literally see the dude's face drop. And he's, just, he's stammering, stumbling for words. Oh, 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 oh we, we already hired. We're, we're not hiring anymore. Hmm. Like, I literally just talked to you 30 minutes ago, dude. You didn't just hire, you know, it, it didn't change in 30 minutes. You know what yeah. it is, right? And it's, it's uh, devastating. I mean, that's part of black life, right? There's You know, we're talking about employment in general, but I mean, you can any facet of life, you can go down the line, talk about how it's a little bit different, how it's a little more challenging, how you really have to have develop a certain level of thick skin and not let that experience, you know, um, it's, it's impossible for it not to affect you, but not let it hold you back, not let it hold you down. In fact, if nothing else, make that make you want to double down on trying to break through this kind of level of injustice, try to break through so that you can open the door for others and hold that door open for others to rush through. So I always tell that story because I always, you know, I want them to understand that, you know, I came from a similar place Mm -hmm. and I understand what they're going through, what they're facing out there and how sometimes it is, it can be so discouraging, but you just can't let it. You got to keep fighting. You got to keep believing in yourself and knowing who you are. And it took me a long time to really be comfortable with my identity of blackness, especially in a professional setting. How much, you know, I was terrified of letting my blackness out. You know, that was going to scare the white people around me. They're going to look at me a certain way that I I felt this responsibility that I had to fight against every single stereotype out there and prove that I'm not that. Right. Prove my professionality, prove my worth. It took a long time for me to feel comfortable being a little black and letting, you know, 
letting that out, letting, letting my culture out. I think that was an important part of the process for me to where I'm at now is, you know, I feel comfortable with my black. I mean, it's not something that even still, you know, there's always times where it's like, okay, how do I, you know, but I, now I've come much more to terms with it. And it's a very difficult thing when you're, when you've been taught that your blackness is going to be a detriment to you, not by just words, but by experiences. Right. Even if it's understated, if it's not, even if that blackness is only the color of your skin or maybe the way you wear your hair, right? Even if that's the, the only thing that is separating you, right? You're still taught that that black. So if, if just the color of my skin or, you know, how my hair might look can be a detriment, how am I supposed to feel comfortable at any other elements of my blackness enter into that professional space? So when you were on this panel, you had, there are other professionals. Are there areas where you see that it is easier or harder when it comes to the professional life? I think that, um, or sectors or different industries where people have made a lot of headway and sure. I, I think it all it looks different in different ways. I think the more mainstream your industry is, the more difficult it's going to always be, right? Like if you are, for example, if you're in the beauty industry, you know, a hairdresser or a beautician or a barber, then that's going to be a little bit different because your clientele is black, right? You're mm-hmm. in most cases. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Right. So, so it depends on your work environment, right? Okay. And now if you're a coder or in politics like me or in um, finance or real estate, you know, these are other people that, that were on the panel. Oftentimes you're the black person in the room. You know, mm-hmm. and, and in politics, all, many a table I sat at where I'm the I'm the black guy, right? And so, how do you balance that? How do you represent your race well and try to be the voice to make sure that they are represented in the conversation, in the way that you just even the operation and the perspective is being represented, and you want to, you feel this great responsibility to bring that to the table. Yet, I'm one person, right? That's a lot of responsibility. We're not just one, you one know, unit, one culture. Yeah. You know, when people oftentimes want to, with any, you know, all blacks are the same, all Latino, they want to classify you as all being this kind of homogeneous unit. Well, well, no, we're just as heterogeneous as any other, right? We all shapes, sizes, interests, abilities, capabilities, personalities, backgrounds, Mm -hmm. right? There's plenty of black middle class. There's plenty of underprivileged blacks as well. Mm -hmm. Um, There's wealthy blacks. There's well-educated blacks. We come in all we, all those aspects of life. Though people want to helping people to understand that when they what they really think is because they do lack of exposure. There's with a few exceptions, we're all you know from the hood, right? So, and even if we're from the hood, we still have that wide variety of of background. Yeah, it sounds to me like there's these two conflicting things where um, you want to assert yourself as a professional individual with your own goals and aspirations, and then at the same time have this weight of responsibility for everyone else in the room who is not black to represent and not in any not feed into any kind of it, wondering what their stereotype of what you're supposed to be, and then what you're trying to. I, no, I can see what you mean. It's a, lot of- it's a lot. You carry a lot. You just, it's not like you just walk in. It's like, Hey, here it is. And that's a thing that, you know, people don't understand about white privilege, right? It's that you don't, if you're, if you're white, you don't have to carry that into the room with you, right? You carry you not to say that you don't have other things that you carry into the room that you have, you know, a whole host of idiosyncrasies and insecurities that you're dealing with, right? And trying to be the best in competition and all those things. But you don't have that added extremely heavy burden of I also have to carry my blackness in. I have to represent my people. I can't I can't fail. I can't I can't fall into this stereotype. You spend a lot of time trying to counteract feeling responsible to counteract what other people may think. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the transitions for me or just um, self-realization is that I can't worry about that. I got to worry. Focus on me. And being the best me that I can be. Right. That doesn't say that I get to shirk my responsibility to my people to make sure that I'm kicking that door down, high performing, and making sure that I'm creating opportunities for others to come behind me to reach my level and beyond. But what I'm saying is that you can't, if you spend so much time worrying about trying to impress other people or trying to buck a stereotype, 
or some other suckers that trying to convince them of who you know or what you are that's a unfair yoke to have around your neck right Mm -hmm. the reality is you just have to just be the best you can be take those opportunities don't hesitate to educate people when that when the time is right for sure you know, there's there's times when you have to be, you have to have some tough conversations and some get real moments with folks, and you don't know how that's going to turn out. But being true to yourself, well, but also balancing that with how true do I want to get? Because I also don't want to lose my job or limit my upper mobility because they see, oh, this guy's an angry black guy um, or an angry black woman. You know, and, th- and you hear um, many black professionals will have that kind of that balance if. If they have to work in a predominantly white environment where they have to feel that balance of, you know, how much of my blackness can I let out? What's the line between I'm letting my blackness out of my my natural person and who I am out, but not letting it so much where it's not also it's also not professional and appropriate. And and that's a fine line because sometimes some things just aren't appropriate in a professional atmosphere. You got to understand what is and isn't appropriate. Right. But letting your blackness out is not always inappropriate, while others may think that it is if that makes inappropriate absolutely oh yeah yeah. no I, I think so because i think that the concept of being professional has been narrowly defined as essentially white and right. so anything that's outside of that so you have people trying to fit into that definition when really it's just a white definition instead of a professional and, and to definition. take another white male yes well okay i have to ask you what is an example of a get real moment then when someone when says something, when someone says something insensitive, and you have to call them on it, you can't let that shit slide. Sometimes, and sometimes it's a point where it's like, you know what? They may not like me telling them this, but I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to put up with a particular comment or a particular slant or something that's insensitive, that's offensive to me. Right. That that's generally my line. If if I'm offended or you know, and I'm a pretty, you know, open guy and I, you know, I'm not uh, that sensitive. But, you know, there's a moment where I'm like, mm, that didn't feel right in my gut. That didn't feel right. Then I'm going to have to call people on it. Now, I definitely didn't start out of my career being that, being able to be comfortable and confident and also accomplished enough to where I know I can now say that. Right. Mm-hmm. If someone, a, a younger professional or someone that's just starting out in their career, they may not have that leeway or feel that comfort level where they can. And it's not even perceived. It's real. Right. They, mm-hmm. they If they call something out, they may be perceived as, oh, mm, here's a problem. Right. And that's going to limit their mobility. Right. I've, I'm fortunate that I'm in a position where I can talk some shit and I'll be OK. Right. To a certain degree. But then I also balance that out with like an intense work ethic and um, high professional standard for myself. And for the people that I manage, and I hold myself to a very high bar. I'm not saying that I'm always successful in every single thing that I do. We all have success and failures professionally. That's just part of you. If you're not failing, then you're not trying hard enough. See, <laughs> yes, that's, Zadie knows what I'm talking about. But at the same time, one of the privileges of having to have some, having had some success in my career and built some good relationships and networks is that. If something I can call, I'm in a position where I can call things out yeah. and it's my responsibility to do so because I am in that position to be able to do that. Were there other people on the panel when they were sharing some of their experiences and you thought, oh yeah, I know exactly what they're talking about or. Yeah. There's a coder. He felt that pressure of like, man, I got to really do, you know, I'm young and I'm the only black guy here. Got to show and prove that I'm the best. There's a weight. Okay. There's a developer that talks about the lack of respect he gets as a black developer when he's, you know, as a developer, there's just not people like him. There's not people that, you know, there's not a lot of black folks in, that are developing, but that are, you know, developing real estate because they don't have a, they've been systemically locked out of access to capital to be able to, to do that. I didn't even think about that. You're right. Why there wouldn't be as many people in real estate. Now, this yeah. this kind of relates to my work, right? The, the barriers to building are so high in this state in terms of especially around residential property that you have to have access to extremely large amounts of capital to be able to overcome all the hurdles that it takes to build. And it's so expensive without having really robust minority programs that can help, you know, minority developers really or, you know, 
encouraging minorities to become developers, even or mom and pop developers to develop their own property. You're going to have continue to have displacement and gentrification and kind of a, a lockout of people of color from being able to become, you know, um, having that kind of uh, generational wealth to, to be able to do things like develop property and to become ultimately larger and larger developers um, because they just don't have, they haven't historically and to this day don't have the access to the capital to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Part of this engagement had to do with Black History Month, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Black History Month. I mean, it was, that was the theme. It was, this was Uh, part of their Black History Month programming. Okay. So Black History Month, what to you maybe is a staple of, let's say, really good reading or just a classic that if somebody wants to engage in some literature or music or film or something, what comes to your mind? I like mean, something that everybody it, should know. There's such a wide variety. It's so I hard know. to. I mean, I could sit here and talk about different things, and there's so much I don't even know that others would recommend. I think Black History Month just starts with the appreciation of Black history in general, and that how critical and important Black history, the Black experience, you know, and when I say Black experience, I'm talking about the slave experience and everything that's grown out of that in this country, how, you know, the history of this country is black history. It's not a month. It's Mm -hmm. our history, period, Um, in so many different, so many different ways. And one of the things that you were saying before was, it's a, okay, this is the conundrum, is that, you know, there is this effort to highlight black thinkers or just black history in general. Which is great. Don't get me wrong. At the same time, yeah. At the same time, it suggests that this is somehow isolated from American history. Right. And that's, I think that's my problem with it, right? It's like, yes, we should highlight black history month. It should be a celebration, but it shouldn't be one month out of the year. It shouldn't be the shortest month out of the year. Ironically. Um, It's not even like MLK's birthday month, right? Um, (laughs) you know, we have MOK day in January, Uh which is great. I'm all about that. Right. Like, yes, we should absolutely have MOK day, but we could also have Malcolm X day. We could have, I mean, we could have, uh, uh, Harriet Tubman day. That's the conundrum. Like you're appreciated that at least one month a year, we have this celebration of black history. Right. But it also highlights the problem that it shouldn't be divorced from our history. It is part of our history. American culture is black culture. If yeah. you think about it, the other white culture in the Americas is comes from it's from all the different countries in Europe. Right. It's not a uniquely American culture. Black culture is the foundation of that from the music to the food to the athletics. You know, people don't realize that hockey started from the earliest hockey teams were actually blacks that, you know, saw uh, Native American field hockey and said, hey, let's do this on ice. You know, you have your earliest hockey teams in uh, northern northeastern Canada, hmm. um, all black hockey teams at the turn of the century. So, you you know, there's this history that is, you know, all the great literary works, the great political works, the economic system found on the backs of free labor, um, the atrocity, you know, the. The, the atrocities of our forefathers, right? Until we get real about that and we t- about like hi- teach history as including, you know, all the, the tremendous contributions of African Americans mm-hmm. uh, to our history, you know, and being able to call them out and point them out and celebrate them right alongside the history of our founding fathers, right? We can celebrate the founding fathers, but also, you know, call out the problematic nature of that and give that equal treatise. Well, let me ask you, okay, let's say you have a magic wand and you can be in charge of the syllabus for Black History Month. What would be some of the, or who are some contemporary thinkers? You know, there's reading works on from Frederick Douglass and um, reading, uh, educating yourself on uh, some of the struggles in the lives of like people like Harriet Tubman, you know, but also looking at your Marcus Garvey's that, that preach, you know, black independence to your contemporary, you know, your Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man to your, you know, autobiography of Malcolm X and some of his readings and works and some of the things that he talked about in terms of being proud of your blackness and self-reliance. Uh, MLK, obviously. Do you have a memory of, let's say, when you were young and you were reading a work that just really leapt out to you and it was the first time you like connected and said, oh, this is like 
me. I'm asking that because I can remember feeling that way when I was reading women thinkers. I can remember that moment of just saying, oh, this exists. There's somebody like like me. I think of um, probably the most impactful uh, reading for me was the autobiography of Malcolm X because of the timing of it all. Mm -hmm. Um, I read it when I was like a freshman in college, I believe. And it really, you know, propelled me to be proud of of myself, proud of my blackness um, and accepting of it and really unapologetic about it. Right. And helped me to formulate, to start moving towards feeling more comfortable in my skin and and who I am and appreciative of who I am. (laughs) Yes, Sadie, you can read Autobiography of Malcolm X, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that was probably one of the most impactful readings Mm -hmm. um, just because of the time it was. You know, I just my freshman year in college, you know, I'm at a uh, just the timing at which it came. I think other things that resonated with me, Black Boy by Richard Wright was really powerful. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man was really powerful in that that feeling of invisibility really resonated. It makes it's it's a very real thing, right? It's. People just don't see you, you know, don't see that all the contributions or appreciate you as an equal, as an equal human being. Right. Mm -hmm. But then there's also other great newer works. Right. Like, you know, art writers like uh, Ty Nessie Coates or. um, I love his stuff. I think he's going to be one of the more important voices that in 100 years when people are studying this time, he's going to be. One of those ways. There's just something very special about his work. You can right. tell. Um, you know, you know, the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander is also great. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's, it's kind of like one of those things. It's similar to when someone writes a great literary work that's not black. You say, "Oh, that's a great literary work." When it's a black author, it's like, "Oh, this is a great black mm-hmm. literary work." It's like almost like a different category. Well, no, it's it's a great literary work, and I think that's kind of the gets to the root of it, right? Like. The first thing that our first identifications right. are is black first and then whatever else. He's a black, da, 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 right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to it's just a great author. You don't say, oh, that's a great white author, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you might say, oh, that's a great, I think, I, I feel like there is some intersectionality between, you know, black and like, say, you know, being a woman, right? That's a great, you hear that often, like, oh, that's a great female author, mm-hmm. right? It's a female first and then da, 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 da. Now, obviously, it's complicated because, you know, if you're a white woman, you're still marrying a white, you know, generally your partner is white. And so you are still benefiting from white privilege in, in many ways that blacks don't. And if you're a black woman, you are really catching hell from all angles. So that has to be called out. But I do think there's a lot of similarity in the sectionality between, you know, the struggles of being black and being, I mean, it, it's a little different, but definitely there's some intersectionality there and you can see strains of injustice. And I, and I'm definitely a firm believer that, you know, just the same way as I don't, you know, I look at the LGBTQ community, I think it's LGBTQ plus or something now, you know, I'm old school. I'm trying to keep up with all this stuff. (laughs) You see some of that same intersectionality there within their struggles and what they have to deal with. And then when you are black and you deal with racist members of your own community and people that hate you because that you are expressing your love in a different way that they that they and they are comfortable with. So while the struggles are different and I don't believe in like, oh, it's the same thing. Like, no, it is not. It's two completely different things we're talking about. Slavery is particularly inhumane. That's actually the basis of it was the lack of humanity. I'm not one to say, oh, my struggle is deeper than yours. I'm just saying that it's just different. But you can also see the similarities and the intersectionality of the two in that, you know, uh, if you're not, and and I believe that if if you're not free, then I'm not free, right? If if you are discriminating against someone in the LGBTQ community, you know, I can't get down with that either, right? Right. If you're being misogynistic, no, I I, I can't get down with that either. Like, I believe that, you know, your struggle, we, we have to start supporting each other. You know, all those that are oppressed have to come together. What you absolutely cannot do is start fighting each other, all of us oppressed peoples fighting each other for crumbs off the table as opposed to coming together and demanding a seat at the table. Yeah. Right? If we come together, if oppressed peoples come together and say, you know what? We will not be oppressed anymore. You will not, if we're women, you will not rape us and not pay us equally for our work. You will not 
treat us as less human, right? If we're Latinos, we, you will not treat us this way. As the LGBTQ community, we are allowed to love and live how we want and free. Mm-hmm. Um, and just as, as Black folks, our issues are real. Systemic racism is real. And mass incarceration is real. Redlining and, and having us locked out of communities and jobs and, and generational wealth is real. Mm-hmm. Um, and we and all of these things are real. And together, we're going to fight to make sure that we are at the table. We're going to come together and make sure that we have this seat. And you're going to demand. We're not going to ask your permission. We're going to take it through our collective action and demand it. That's how we'll all get ahead. But if, if, if we if we try to, if, you know, we fall into this. My struggle is bigger than your struggle and your str- We can appreciate the differences, but we have to, to find ways to work together and demand and, and not fall into that trap of where the, the, of the divide and conquer. Right. What can people who are not black learn from Black History Month or from black literature or I politics it, or history? I mean, I think it's all of it. I think it's opening your eyes to our culture, to our struggle. You know, um, while, you know, you may not be able to ever be black, you can be an ally. You can understand that it's not just, oh, these people don't want to help themselves out or, oh, that's unfortunate that this incident happened. You know, oh, yeah, you might be someone that says, oh, you know, what happened to Trayvon Martin? That's not right. Or, you know, this police shooting, that's not right. But you have to dig beyond that and understand that it's it's not individual incidents. It's a system that perpetuates this type of violence and degradation, lack of access. I think Um, that's one of the biggest communication problems. I think that what you just said is probably one of the biggest issues is that these things are, that's one of the divides is that it's an incident versus a a systemic issue. And most, and that's the problem. People see You'll have someone that says, oh, this is racist act that this incident is terrible. I don't can't. I, this is horrible. They should be punished. It should not happen. Outrage. Yet at the same time, you are perpetuating. You can still in the same breath be perpetuating a system of racism that is keeping blacks as a permanent underclass. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's by design. How do you unite people from 15 different countries in Europe? The the Irish and the and the Italians and the Polish and the English and the French and the mm-hmm. you know Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans. How do you have them accept the proposition that we live in a country that's it's really about have and have nots, right? Mm-hmm. How do you keep this system working and, and keep the keep people placated that don't have that there's plenty of white folks that, that the system is screwing like that have no opportunity. The reality is, is if you don't, if you're not born into money and access, you will, you will die with no money and no access. The likelihood that you're going to strike it rich or make it into, the, you know, the upper class in terms of wealth is extremely unlikely because it takes money to make money in this country. That's just that we're a capitalist mm-hmm. society. That's what it is. And there's not, there's, and we're a society that has a mi- <laughs> We're a society that has minimal protections to help people. There's no safety net. There's no, you know, we don't have the same level of safety net that other countries where people keep people from falling on their face. Yeah. We don't have equity in our education system, right? No matter for amongst white people. But the way that you can keep, you know, especially when you're talking about the turn of the century, when you had the big migrations, Mm -hmm. you know, these folks are living in slums in, in, you know, tenements. It was terrible. You know, they were being t- absolutely taken advantage of by by big cap- wealthy capitalists, right? The haves. But the one unifying factor that they had was, oh, but at least you're not black. You insert a I permanent see. you insert a permanent underclass, right? So no matter who you are, if you're white, you're still not at the bottom of the barrel. What gives you hope? Cuz things are better. You know, I've seen it in my lifetime. Oh my god. We had a black president. To be clear, I'm not saying we're in a post racial society. That is not (laughs) what I'm saying. That is some bullshit. (laughs) But what I am saying is that there are gains. You know, Mm -hmm. it's what was acceptable when I was a kid coming up in the late 70s and 80s, you know, really the 80s when I was aware. You had guys like Al Campanis, the the GM for the Dodgers on Nightline talking about, oh, you know, blacks aren't suited for management. There's a reason why they're not managers or quarterbacks 
you know, and I, I played with black guys. I love black guys, but you know, there's a reason behind it, right? It's okay. And that was okay. I mean, yeah, he got censored. He ended up having to get fired, but he wasn't saying anything that other people didn't think. Everyone thought that there was a reason why blacks, when I was young, blacks weren't playing quarterback. Opportunities are few and far between. Oh, you can't think you're not, you know, black being a coach, hell to the no, right? So you're now seeing that while it's still an uphill battle, we're still not there yet. I'm, don't get it twisted. We're not there. But you're seeing progress. You're seeing several of the top quarterbacks in the NFL now are black and an acceptance of that athleticism not being, you know, before it was like, oh, you know, they they're almost like you're too athletic to play quarterback, right? Like, oh, that was something that was now it's like, well, hey, why don't we embrace that? And that actually makes that better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it makes it makes white folks better. Right. Like when you racism doesn't just hurt black people. It hurts America. Um, yeah. Yeah. It hurts everybody. It hurts everybody yeah. because you're having a system that's you're, you're holding. It doesn't ba- hurt everyone the same way. I should. <laughs> Let us be I wanna clear. Qu- I want to qualify sure. that. <laughs> but yeah, but, but it definitely but hurts we're everyone. The only victims are not black folks. You're victimizing our whole system because you're holding the best, some of the best and brightest back by not letting them achieve to their highest potential or you're locking them up so they can't contribute. You know, how many brilliant minds are, are rotting away in jail because we gave them no resources and because we suspended them at higher rates because we didn't give them a second chance like white kids get, right? A white kid gets in a little trouble as a kid. You're a kid. We're locking kids away for, for, for minor offenses for years and years and years, ruining any hope that they have of any advancement or realizing their dreams. Whereas a white kid says, hey, hey, okay, he's young, he's being, you know, he's sowing his wild oats, let's give him another chance. And the studies show that our brains don't even develop fully till we're like 25, 26. So are you locking someone that's 18, 17, 18, 19 in jail for 20, 10, 20 years, right? In an environment that breeds, you know, where they're not having the, the, where you've created a system where you're pulling, now you're creating this perpetual system where you're pulling guidance and leadership out of the home. You're keeping families separated. You're destroying families, decimating families with drugs and that are being pumped into these communities with unfair prison sentences, with unfair legal system, with unfair trials, Mm-hmm. Right. If you look at the truck, I mean, the, I can get on Kenro. That's a whole nother podcast. But <laughs> the point being is that all this contribution that you could that we could be benefiting from, we aren't because we're because of our stupid system of systemic racism. And so it's hurting all of us. You know, these are contributions to society that could be amazing. Mm-hmm. We could all, you know, it, when you have an equal and, and a society where people have the, where the great, the, the best and brightest can actually find a pathway to succeed, that only helps everyone. Those are contributions, critical contributions that we're missing out on because we're locking them away or we're not providing the resources to realize their full potential. Mm-hmm. You want people to realize their full potential, whatever that is, because that only makes our society better. That's how you get to be, get to grow as a society, how you get to move forward, how you get to be excellent. Excellence doesn't come from one person or one group of people. It comes from society as a whole. Uh, collective excellence of people being able to realize their best and brightest potential. And when you're saying a big chunk of your population doesn't get that, isn't allowed to participate in that, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and that's unfortunate. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, that was good. Okay. How can people get in touch with you? You can't. What is your, what's your Twitter? My Twitter is... At Constantine Hatch, Instagram, Constantine Hatcher. You might see this beautiful little girl on there and some awesome little boys and other stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. And okay. uh, if you want to learn more about housing and how it's an equitable issue and some of the ways that we can solve this crisis here in California so we can make California a place for everyone, not just those that can afford to live here, while everyone else kind of has this kind of intense insecurity. Um That'll have to be a whole nother episode. Yeah, go to CAMB.org and look at all the good, great things that we're doing. Okay. All right. If you have any questions about this episode, you can tweet me at G Dolsky. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash good is in the details. Thank you for listening. Bye. How is she doing? She likes here, Daddy Talk. <laughs> yes, yeah, see.